رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and at the beginning, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our gathering, to forgive our sins and our shortcomings, and to bestow His mercy and His tranquility upon us all. My brothers and sisters in Islam, tonight's topic is titled, Kullu Nafsin Dha'iqatul Mawt. Each and every soul, this includes mankind and jinn kind and angels, and animals, ذائقةُ الموت, will taste death. And we're going to, بإذن الله تعالى, tonight, explain this ayah in Surah Ali Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this reality multiple times in the Qur'an. And death is the only certain fact in life. That is the only certain thing in life. You have plans for tomorrow. And each and every single one of us has a plan for tonight and for tomorrow morning, and for next week. But they are all doubtful. Maybe they happen, maybe they don't happen. But there is one thing that is certain, and one thing that is guaranteed, and there is absolutely no doubt concerning this matter, and that is that each and every single one of us shall taste death. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to wake up every morning, he would say, Alhamdulillahi alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur every single morning as soon as the nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam would open his eyes to this world he would remember death and he would thank allah that he has given him life after he had caused death in other words when a person sleeps that is known as minor death and our minor death is a reminder for us that the major death is about to happen our sleep allah made sleep so that it can serve as a reminder for mankind that they will experience something similar and it would be known as the greater, the major death. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, every morning when he woke up, he would thank Allah that he has given him life once again. This is a huge blessing that you sleep and you wake up the next morning. This is not something to be taken lightly because you could have died in your sleep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allah yatawaffa al-anfusa hina mawtiha, wal-lati lam tamut fi manamiha. It is Allah azza wa jal who removes the soul of the one who dies. And he also removes the soul of the one who is sleeping. Wal-lati lam tamut fi manamiha. He also removes the soul of the person who is sleeping. So now the souls are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the next day approaches, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, فَيُمْسِكُ الَّتِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ If Allah Azza wa Jal had willed death for a person, then He just holds the soul back. It doesn't go. It's not sent. And as a result, they'll realize that their friend, their relative is dead. وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى And if Allah Azza wa Jal, by His permission, has allowed this person to witness yet another day, he sends the soul back to him. And this is why the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say these words, Alhamdulillahi alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur He would thank Allah that he has given him life after he had caused him to die. And also, after this dhikr, in the morning, as soon as the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had opened his eyes, he would follow this dhikr up by saying, Alhamdulillahi alladhi aafani fi jasadi wa radda alayya ruhi wa adhina li bi dhikrih. Then he would say, all oh, praise and thanks belongs to Allah, the one who protected my body in the sleep. Because your body was exposed to a thousand harms and evils that could have affected you as you're sleeping. But Allah Azza wa Jal protected you from scorpion bites, from harm of insects, from cars driving into your house, 
and harming you. Others, that's what happens to them. A shayateen could have attacked you at night. So many harms could have attacked you at night. So as soon as he waked up, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as soon as he woke up, and this is the sunnah, for you to say, Alhamdulillahi alladhi aafani fi jasadi. All praise belongs to him that he protected my body. Wa radda alayya ruhi. And all praise and thanks belongs to him that he returned my soul. Even as you were sleeping, your soul was out. وَأَذِنَ لِي بِذِكْرِهِ And Alhamdulillah, that Allah Azza wa Jal has given me permission to make remembrance of him. Allahu Akbar. That you should feel this dhikr in the morning. As you're saying, all praise and thanks belongs to Allah, that he has given me the permission and ability to make mention of him. And this is as you're making a dhikr. And then you get up and you make wudu and you get prepared for Salat al-Fajr. So many people are missing this blessing. Allah had not given them permission to engage in his dhikr. Allah Azza wa Jal has given you, surely this is a blessing that you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. My brothers and sisters in Islam, this is the state of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As soon as he woke up, he's remembering death and the soul that came out. And also before he sleeps, he would also remember death when he would make a dhikr before sleeping. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, أَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَادِمِ اللَّذَّاتِ He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed us to make mention in abundance concerning the destroyer of pleasures. He referred to death as the destroyer of pleasures. And he said, make mention about it a lot. Because the more you remember it, the more you prepare for it. That's the equation. And he referred to it as هَاذِمُ الَّذَّاتِ The destroyer and the cutter of pleasures. Meaning the pleasures of this worldly life. So a person when he dies, he's cut off from the enjoyments of life. From the enjoyment of a cold drink of water on a summer's day. He's cut from that. From a delicious meal that he also and always would look forward to. From a hangout with his friends, in which he used to sit with and enjoy hours and hours go by. From any entertainment that he would sit and enjoy, whether it's watching footy matches, or enjoying time on his Xbox, or the many forms of entertainment that we have in today's modern world. All of a sudden it is cut from his life, and he faces a new reality. He's entered a new life. قوب حياة البرزخ الإمام القرطبي رحمه الله he says the one who remembers death often is rewarded with three things number one he hastens to التوبة he rushes to repenting to Allah سبحانه وتعالى that's the benefit of remembering death it prepares the believer this is why we speak about it much this is why it is mentioned in the Quran much one of its benefits is that it rushes and hastens the believer towards at tawbah Number two, he is content with what he has. That's a benefit of making mention of death. You're content with what you have. Because when you remember death, and you remember that he's going to cut the worldly pleasures away from you, then why am I after so much? When all of it will be gone when I die. So alhamdulillah, I'm happy with what I have. That's the idea. And the third is that he will have energy to worship. When you remember death, and you know that when you die, after that, there is no more chance to engage in good deeds. No more chance to say Astaghfirullah. No more chance to open a Quran and read an ayah and memorize. Finished. خلاص. So as a result, when you know this is the reality of death, it creates a panic in the heart. But that panic, you should convert it into good energy. And that panic should be positive in the sense that now you're leading a better life and engaging in righteous deeds and collecting as many hasanat as you can before you depart this world. Well, as for the disbeliever, this is a dead topic. Death is a dead topic. They don't speak about it. They don't like speaking about it. It's something that happens later. 
so I'll deal with it later. That's the attitude we ask Allah Azza wa to save us. This is them. And as a result, no preparation, no looking forward to the meeting with Allah, no belief in this at all. And this is something that the kuffar at the time of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, وَقَالُوا مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا وَمَا يُهْلِكُنَا إِلَّا الدَّهْرِ They say that this is our worldly life. We live and we die. And the only thing that is being wasted from us is time. That's the only thing that is causing destruction and death. Because as time goes by, we age, we age, we age. And when we get into all the age, nature has dictated that we die. No belief in Allah, no belief in anything. And as a result, why are we going to talk about this topic? This is a kafir's perspective. For so long as the topic of death is alive in your heart, and you continue to listen to its reminders, then alhamdulillah, such a person is upon a good path. Such a person Allah Azza wa Jal is pleased with. Allah Azza wa Jal would remind him so that he wakes up and he leads that good lifestyle, preparing himself for the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Each and every single soul shall taste death. He did not say, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ستموت. He did not say every soul will die. He said every soul will taste death. What does that mean? Al-Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says that the soul in the body of a person doesn't die. The soul never dies. It only tastes death. What dies is the actual body. And then that's disposed of. And it is put in the earth. And then the creatures would eat on it until it has ended and finished and withered away. The soul doesn't die. And there is the word of taste. The soul will taste death as it comes out, shifts from hayatul dunya, from the worldly life, transitioning into hayatul barzakh into the life of the grave. It only tastes death, moving from one to another. That's all. Otherwise you and your mind and your thought and your ability to sense what's around remains with a person as he transitions from this worldly life to the next. For this is the benefit of ذَائِقَةُ mawt Tastes. And you know taste can sometimes be sweet and can sometimes be bitter and sour. Therefore, we're learning as well from the word ذائقة that people are of two types. Some will have a sweet experience, an enjoyable experience as they die. In that case, it's not something bad. It's actually something to look forward to. It has a twist, sweet taste to it. And that is the case of the believer. And as for the case of the disbeliever, then it is a bitter, sour taste because what is ahead is much intense and difficult for him. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the soul, it comes out of the human body in six stages. We want to speak about these six stages that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran and they were mentioned by the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the ahadith. There is not a specific ayah that says it's six stages and it lists them. And there is no hadith that does so. But a wholesome look, a holistic look on the Quran and the Sunnah, you can bring these out and you can put them one after the other and we can explain them. Number one, when the soul or when a person is going to die, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angels that are responsible to take this individual soul. So the angels, Allahu A'lam, in their tens, in their hundreds, in their thousands, are sent to this person. Because even though it is Malakul Mawt that takes the soul out, his job is the last job. And this Malakul Mawt has an army of angels that work for him. They're the ones that extract the soul first and foremost. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, "Hatta idha jaa ahadakum al mawtu, tawafathu rusuluna." Our messengers, meaning our angels, 
will cause him to die. That's in the first stage. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, الَّذِينَ تَتَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ The angels. They are coming down to extract this soul. So in the first stage, Allah sends these angels to this person. In the first stage, it is the day of your death. Allahu A'lam. In which hour of the day or hour of the night it would be. But there is a day of death that is written for each and every single one of us. Some on the 1st of October 2022. Some on the 1st of January 2013 or 2030. Whatever it is, each and every single one of us has a day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ See the day in which you would return to Allah, even there is a day. Allah tells you, fee and protect yourself and work for that day in which you would return to Allah, there is a day. On that day, exactly as soon as this day enters, the angels are prepared and they're ready and they're coming down. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ The angels come down. That's the first stage. The second stage, these angels have arrived. They're at the body now. And each and every single person who dies goes through these six stages. For some people, they go through the six stages in an hour. Maybe some in a minute. Maybe some over a few days and could be over a few weeks, over a few months. But these stages will be the case for each and every single living soul. The second stage is the collection of the soul from the body. So the angels begin by extracting the soul from the tip of the toes. And as a result, the toes go cold and numb. And the soul is being pulled out upwards. So now it's collected from the foot. And it's collected from the shin. And it's collected from the knees. And a person begins to feel coldness and numbness in his feet. And it rises until it reaches the hips. Until it reaches his abdominal area. It comes out from the tips of his fingers. Until it reaches his arm, his hand. It goes all the way. This is the angel's job. They begin to extract and prepare this soul to come out. And a person senses that something is happening and something is going wrong with his body. That's when all these machines, if he's in the hospital, begin to give abnormal readings. The third stage is the stage in which the soul reaches at taraqi Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Kalla idha balagat taraqi Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentions the third stage in Surah Al-Qiyamah, he says, when the soul reaches At-Taraqi, what Taraqi comes from the word at turquwa which is the collarbone here. So this is the third stage. The entire soul in the body has now reached this area here, Taraqi. This is the time in which Allah would say, وَقِيلَ مَنْ رَاقَ Those around him would say, who is the Raqi? Where's the doctor? Where's the nurse? Where's someone that can come and do something for him? Hurry up! There is panic at this moment. وَقِيلَ مَنْ رَاقُ وَظَنَّ أَنَّهُ الْفِرَاقُ And the person that is laying there knows certainly this is the moment of departure. وَظَنَّ أَنَّهُ الْفِرَاقُ He knows it. He has seen it. وَظَنَّ أَنَّهُ الْفِرَاقُ Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, that the foot of the person is wrapped with his other foot. Now what does this mean? You know when a person dies, no one goes to his left foot and holds it and folds it over the right. It doesn't happen. So what does this ayah mean? That the foot has been wrapped with the other foot. It's been folded over it. You know what this implies? You see, if you are to stand and you put your left foot and you crossed it on your right. If you crossed your feet, would you be able to walk? You can't walk. 
In other words, this person is now immobile. He cannot work and he cannot walk. Finished. This is the end of him. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal would describe death as a musibah, a calamity. Allah said, فَأَصَابَتْكُمْ مُصِيبَةُ الْمَوْتِ When the calamity of death strikes you, إِلْتَفَّتِ السَّاقُ بِالسَّاقُ The foot is over the other. So that refers to the fact that a person cannot move forward anymore. You cannot read Qur'an anymore. Death is a calamity because you cannot say Astaghfirullah anymore. What is the feeling of a person in the grave? has been there years and years and cannot say Astaghfirullah. You can no longer pray two rak'at. You can no longer give sadaqah. You can no longer do al-hajj wal-umrah. You can no longer do any goodness. You cannot look at the sky and say, Subhanallah, iltaffat al-saq bil-saq, finished. Iza mata ibn Adam in qata'a amaluh. When the son of Adam dies, his good deeds come to an end. No more walking to the masjid. No more listening to the adhan and repeating after the mu'adhin. No more Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. No more of this. It has ended for this person. التفت الساق بالساق إلى ربك يوم إذن المساق On that day, you will be driven to Allah. المساق, because you cannot walk anymore, you are driven to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On that day, to your Lord is المساق, is the drive. That's when the angels are going to look after this person from then on. This is the third stage. The fourth stage in how the soul comes out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُومِ Now the soul has moved from at taraqi from the collarbone, and it has pushed up towards Al-Hulqum, which is the throat. Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned this in the Quran. إِذَا بَلَغَتِ Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُومِ At that moment, Allah says, وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذٍ تَنْظُرُونَ Those around him are looking. They are looking. That's it. There's nothing else they could do other than look at him. وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذٍ تَنْظُرُونَ Allah is speaking about the family and those around him. They are looking at him. وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْكُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُبْصِرُونَ Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, And we are closer to him than you, however you cannot see it. What does this mean? It means that the angels of Allah are closer to him than you and you cannot see them. And the dying person sees the angels. He sees them. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says that the dying person sees the angels, perhaps he could respond as salam to them. And he would say, وَعَلَيْكُمُ salam," And those around him can't see this. They have no clue what's happening. And perhaps he could Respond as salam to them, as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said. So he sees them, and he speaks to them, and perhaps they speak to him. And those around him, what dua they're making, the angels are saying ameen to it. So those around the dead should ask Allah that Allah save this person from fitnatul mamat, because it is at this moment that the person experiences fitnatul mamat, the trial and the test of death. What is fitnatul mamat? Because it is at this stage that it happens. As the soul is it, al hulqum That's it. Halas, after this it's leaving. This is the worst of the stages. This is the painful stage. This is the most difficult stage. This is when the high blood pressure is up. The pressure is up on the blood. This is when the breathing becomes extremely difficult. Then now the soul is being prepared to come out. All of this is those angels that are around. But this is when fitnatul mamat happens. This is why in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us that at the end of the prayer, do not conclude your salat unless you say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min azab al-nar wa min azab al-qabr 
ومن فتنة المحيا والممات ومن فتنة المسيح الدجال Every single salat you are to say this dhikr this dua asking Allah to protect you from the fitna of death and there was a companion by the name of Tawus radiyallahu anhu Tawus he asked his son he always used to ask him he told his son after he had prayed a prayer he said to him did you make that dhikr that dua at the end of the salat his son said to him I forgot he told him get up and pray again it is a sunnah but this is how important this dua was for them he said to his son get up and pray again and make this dua just before you make a taslim fitnatul mamat the trial of death is at the stage of al-hulqum and that is when a shaytan will have the last battle with you a shaytan is present he will use all his energy he has and all his skill to cause you to doubt Allah and his messenger and Islam he'll throw it all at you at that time and it happened to Imam Ahmad and the story is long and it happens to everyone fitnatul mamat why is it important you see why it's important to always ask Allah to protect you so that if he appears to you at the final moment in life you're able to say la ilaha illallah and you repeat it ignoring his waswas ignoring his doubts Allah will give the believer the ability to say la ilaha illallah if he was someone committed upon this word and what trains you to say la ilaha illallah at that moment is to repeat the adhan with the muaddin especially at salat al-fajr because you know when you're sleeping and you hear adhan al-fajr you're still in a drunken state as you're sleeping you're still opening your eyes trying to get up if you hear the adhan even if you hear it on the clock or on your phone and the salat time has entered some ulama mention the permissibility of repeating after these devices so if you hear the adhan on your phone then say after the muaddin allahu akbar allahu akbar and until he reaches la ilaha illallah if you're able to say la ilaha illallah at the end of the adhan after the muaddin has said it while you're still in this drunken state of half asleep half awake then this is a good sign that when you're in the other drunken state of death you'll be able to say la ilaha illallah at that time that's the measure for this is the hulqum وانتم حين اذ تنظرون ونحن اقرب اليه منكم ولكن لا تبصرون الله عز وجل then he challenges mankind especially those who regret and reject the afterlife and reject the resurrection he says فلولا ان كنتم غير مدينين ترجعونها ان كنتم صادقين الله اكبر الله عز وجل he says if you certainly believe that there is no afterlife and you're adamant that there is no afterlife there is no resurrection then push the soul back into the body if you're truthful Allah challenged every person who rejects the day of resurrection he says to them if you indeed believe that you will not be resurrected and questioned and held accountable on that day return this soul push it back if you're truthful but obviously no one can do that so this is a proof in and of itself that the matter is in Allah's hand and he is who controls the soul and its removal and he was the one in control when he put the soul in since you realize that and that you cannot return it and you cannot have and you don't have any ability to bring the person back to life and to push the soul back into his body then you should very well know that the matter is on Allah's hand and he is the one who said there's a resurrection so believe in it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made death a proof of resurrection because up until this day no one has responded to this challenge of Allah azza wa yes there are evil wicked 
people on earth that are currently trying to challenge this. Millionaires and billionaires, without mentioning their names, are purchasing and investing in technology that preserves the body until a later ye years, perhaps as time goes by, someone can figure out how to push a soul or how to bring back a person from the dead. And until now, these bodies are being preserved in some kind of liquid. So when this technology comes, which will never come, perhaps then they can put life into this person. People are, Allahu Akbar, look at the disbelief. It has reached a stage in which people want to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the idea is, it will never happen. in kuntum sadiqeen. But this is the fourth stage. The soul now is at al hukum The people around can only look, can't do anything. And the one that is dying can see things they can't see. The fifth stage, and this is now the extraction of the soul. And this is the job of Malakul Mawt, the big boss. This is his job now. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that the souls of living matters in the sight of Malakul Mawt is like food on a plate. He has everyone in sight. And his job is just to do the final plucking. The final stage, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned it in Surah Al Nazi'at. He said, These are two stages, two situations. Al Nazi'at Gharqa are the angels that rip out the soul. Malak al Mawt ripping out the soul from this body. Is Al-Nashd. Al-Nashd is to undo a shoelace effortlessly. You know how sometimes you get the one rope of the shoelace or one part of the lace and you just, you just hold it with one finger and it comes off? That's how the believer's soul is extracted. Whereas the disbeliever's soul, it is ripped out. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, إِذَا كَانَ الْعَبْدُ فِي انْقِطَاعٍ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَإِقْبَالٍ عَلَى الْآخِرَةِ In this stage, when the believer is cutting out from this worldly life and approaching the afterlife, أَتَتْهُ مَلَائِكَةٌ بِيُضُ الْوُجُوهِ Angels, their faces are white and bright and shining and beautiful, would come to him. And they are carrying a shroud from the paradise and a scent from the paradise. And they sit close to his body. Malak al Mawt takes out the soul effortlessly for the believer. And as he takes it out effortlessly, he says, and this here, he says to him, Ayyatuha nafsu tayyibah. The words that Malak al Mawt would say is an entire summary of your, all of your life. It's a summary of your life. If you heard, Ayyatuha nafsu tayyibah, O beautiful, pure soul, come out. Come out to the forgiveness and the pleasure of your Lord. Then this soul is definitely entering the paradise. But Allahu Alam, we don't know. Is it going to be burnt in Jahannam? Is it going to go through Adab al Qabr? Or we don't know. But definitely this soul will enter the paradise. That's what you will know at the time of death. You will know inevitably where you're going. But you have no clue if you're going to have something of Adab al Qabr, punishment of the grave. Or would you go through something of Adab al Nar on the day of judgment? Allahu Alam. But what is certain, this soul will end up in the paradise. Lena, this angel is speaking a summary of your life. And on the other hand, the disbeliever, Malak al Mawt would say, Ayyatuha al Nafsul Khabitha, Ikhruji ila ghadabin min Allahi wa sahab. O evil, wretched soul, come out to an anger of Allah and a displeasure of Allah. That soul is most definitely ending in Jahannam forever. Never to come out. This is how the matter is dispersed on that day. And you know, the soul of the disbeliever, it is ripped out. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, like wool being ripped out of steel. You know, if you had a, a steel ball, a steel ball, and you had wool in there, and you tried, or the opposite way around, there is wool and there's steel in it, and you tried to rip out the steel, 
how much of the wool would be ripped out with it. That's the pain, the excruciating pain that the disbeliever goes through. Why does this happen? Because when he is given this horrible news of an evil, wretched soul, the disbeliever's soul wants to disperse back into the body. Doesn't want to leave because where it's going is a bad place. So it disperses back in and it now it's ripped out. Because the, believer, the disbeliever was living in a paradise in comparison to where he's going. As for the believer, the soul comes out and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, like water being poured out of a bottle. Very simple, very smooth. The iqa, a beautiful taste to it. He has a beautiful taste to it. The kafir's one is a bitter taste to it, a horrible taste to it. So the believer, why does his soul come out effortlessly and very simply and easily? Because he is now in a prison in comparison to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for him, he's in a prison. And whoever's living a life of prison can't wait to leave. For even the body, the soul of a believer gives up, it wants to go. And it is taken all the way up until it reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says to the angels, Uktubu kitaba abdi fi illiyin. Record the book of my slave in illiyin. Keep his book here. And then his soul is returned back into the earth. And then he is questioned. The three big major questions. The questions that a shaytan wanted to distract you from moments before you left this world. You will answer. And after this, the believer's soul is taken back up to the paradise. And it spends the rest of Hayatul Barzakh in the paradise. All of it there. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Nasamatul mu'min ta'irun tu'alliqu min shajar al-jannah. That the soul of the believer, it's molded into the shape of a bird. And it hangs on the trees of the paradise. It roams freely in whichever direction it wants. It eats and it drinks and it enjoys in whichever manner it wants. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, until Allah azza wa jal resurrects mankind, then and only the soul would leave the paradise and go and join its body. And the questioning and the hisab and all that will happen. And then he would enter completely soul and body into the paradise. This is the journey of the soul of the believer. That's the fifth stage. And we mentioned with it the sixth stage. And that is the word of Malakul Mawt. When he says, O oh, pure soul come out, O oh, evil soul come out. That's the sixth stage. By then the person has died and the soul comes out. And that word from Malak al we said, it is a summary of a person's life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, concerning the emotional state of a believer as he's dying, even that is addressed. Of course, the believer is scared, he's terrified, he's anxious. Where is he going? He's got no clue. He's been used to this life 50, 60, 70 years. Where is he going? Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Inna al-ladina qalu Rabbuna Allahu thumma istaqamu tatanazzalu alayhim al-malaika." Those who said our Lord is Allah and committed to this word, remain steadfast upon this word. Angels will descend upon them and they will say to them, they will say to them, "La taqafu wa la tahzanu." La taqafu. Do not be afraid. And you know, a person is always fearful of the future. You don't fear the past. You fear the future. And so they say to him, do not fear. Do not fear the future of your family. Do not fear the future of yourself. And do not be sad and worried. And a person is always sad and worried about his past. Meaning your past, don't worry about it. What you leave behind you, your worry for your sins and your transgression, don't worry about all this. لا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا and they add to this وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون congratulations have some good news the paradise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised is coming your way Allah عز و جل doesn't break his promise نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة والله each believer will hear these words from the angel the angel would say we were your allies in this world of life we looked after you. Allah sent us. 
to you so we can protect you. Every time you read Ayat al-Kursi before you slept, every time you read your adhkar, you prayed, Allah Azzawajal sent angels to protect you. Nahnu awliyaukum. We're a friend of yours. We're an ally. Fi dunya in this worldly life, wa fil akhirah. We're not going to leave you, we're with you. Nahnu awliyaukum fi al-hayati dunya wa fil akhirah. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدْدَعُونَ نُزُلًا مِّنْ غَفُورِ الرَّحِيمِ الله أكبر For the journey of a believer, as he's going to Allah, it's a sweet taste. النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم says in the hadith al-Qudsi that Allah said, listen to how incredible this is. He said, وَمَا تَرَدَّدْتُ عَنْ شَيْءٍ أَنَا فَاعِلُهُ تَرَدُّدِي عَنْ قَبْضِ رُوحِ الْمُؤْمِنِ يكره الموت وأكره مساءته الله أكبر. الله عز وجل he said I never hesitated in doing anything more than I hesitate in taking out the soul of my righteous believing slave. What does that mean? You see, it is not allowed to describe Allah that He hesitates. Allah only hesitates in this one matter. And his hesitation is perfect and complete, not like our hesitation. When we hesitate, it's because we're ignorant. We don't know what's good, what's bad, right? If I want to buy a phone, I hesitate. This one or this, I don't know which one's better because I'm ignorant. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hesitation is upon complete perfect knowledge. It's between two matters. And that is what he says in the hadith. He said, my believing slave, yakrahu al-mawt. He hates death, meaning he hates the pains of death. He hates the suffering of death and what he has to go through. He hates it. He dislikes it. And at the same time, Allah dislikes to harm the slave. Shuf the mercy. Shuf the mercy in the hadith. But then Allah has decreed that of the two matters, the better of the two is that he takes you to him. So he decreed death upon mankind. Yani the hesitation is in the sense that, you know, I'm going to invite you to my place. So I say, should I slaughter for him one sheep or two sheep? That's a good hesitation. In that sense, الْأَعْلَى, there are two good matters here. So Allah Azza wa Jal chooses what's best for the slave. And that is that he goes through death because that's the gateway to meet Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal wants to meet his righteous slave. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before he died, there were two names of Allah that he continuously, frequently recited and he read. And these two names, if you live with them, and these are the two names of Allah that you need the most as you die. And that is when he would say, as Aisha radiallahu anha narrates, that he would say, as his head was in between her chest and her lap, this is where he died, he would say, Bali Rafiq al A'la. Bali Rafiq al A'la. Bali Rafiq al A'la. These are the two names of Allah, and he kept repeating it. The name of Allah al Rafiq. The name of Allah al A'la will soften the pains of death. Ismullah al Rafiq. The friend, the compassionate, the kind, the merciful. As though he's saying, Oh Allah, I'm in need of being in your company. I'm in need of your compassion. And so I choose to go to you, to our Rafiq. Because in this worldly life, how many are hypocrites? How many are fake friends? How many are not compassionate and merciful too? I'm sick of this world. I need to leave. You remember Allah, His name Ar Rafiq. And the name of Allah, Al A'la, the Most High. Reminding yourself that you're in a dunya, which is something low. Because opposite to Al-A'la is Ad-Dani, something that is low, something that is insignificant, something that is worthless. So you remember the name of Allah, Al-A'la. I go ascending to Al-A'la, to the Most High. Two names of Allah that allow the believer to look forward to meeting to Allah Azza wa Jal. These are two names that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would continuously remember about Allah moments before his death. Subhanallah. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ 
and you will surely be paid in full for your good deeds and your bad deeds on the day of judgment. You'll be paid in full to a fauna ujurakum yawm al qiyamah. What does this mean? It means that when you do good in this life, Allah Azza wa Jal will reward you, but not complete reward. And when you do evil and bad and do not repent, there are consequences. And he'll give you some consequences. Not full punishment, some punishment. But to be paid in full for your good happens on the day of judgment only. And to be paid in full for your bad, if there are still sins in your record that haven't been removed and wiped away, it will happen on the day of judgment. So do not be discouraged. When you continuously engage in righteous deeds and you do not see anything, where I can't see what Allah has promised. I can't see it in my life. Relax. Allah didn't promise to pay you in full here. The payment in full is there. Allah said, Anyone. Who is moved away from the fire? Zuhziha anin nar moved away from the fire. And he is udkhil al jannah, admitted into the paradise, faqad faz. He has succeeded. That is the definition of success. Every other definition you know of success, put it on the side. The only definition for success that Allah would give us in His own word, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is. Whoever is removed and moved from the fire and is admitted into the paradise, this is the ultimate success. Allahu Akbar. Money in this life, cars in this life, houses in this life, whatever it is in this life that people amass and enumerate and collect day after day after day, all of this is not success. It's not. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he gives this world the life for the believer and the disbeliever. Both. So if, if it was actual success, it shouldn't land in the hand of a disbeliever. Because these are the people that are most deprived of success. So it's a sign of nothing. The correct success is to be removed from the fire and admitted into the paradise. But how do we do that? How do we do that? There is something you do. And you're able to do every single day in which Allah guarantees the person who does that, then he has removed himself from the path of the hellfire and has put himself on the path of the paradise. Listen to the hadith the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَلِقَ كُلُّ إِنسَانٍ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ عَلَى سِتِّينَ وَثَلَاثِمِئَةِ مِفْصَلٍ Each and every single person of mankind was created with 360 bones, 360 joints. Each and every single one of us. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَمَنْ كَبَّرَ اللَّهَ وَحَمِدَ اللَّهَ وَهَلَّلَ اللَّهَ وَسَبَّحَ اللَّهَ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ اللَّهَ وَعَزَلَ حَجَرًا عَنْ طَرِيقِ النَّاسِ أَوْ شَوْكَةً أَوْ عَظْمًا أَوْ أَمَرَ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ نَهَا عَنْ مُنْكَرْ عَدَدَ تِلْكَ السِّتِّمِئَةٍ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, anyone who says astaghfirullah, or subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, or he removes harm from the people's road, whether it's a bone, or a stone, or a rock, or a needle, or a pin, whatever it is that harms the people, and he commands the people good, and he forbids the evil, in the same amount as his bones, Yani he does and engages in these actions, 360 of them. Yani he sits down and he says, Subhanallah, 360 times. Or, 100 Subhanallah, 100 Alhamdulillah, 100 Allahu Akbar, and then 60 Astaghfirullah. But in total, 360, if he does that in one given day, then he has moved himself from the path of the fire and put himself on the path of the paradise. Meaning if he died that day, he enters the paradise. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ صَامَ يَوْمًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ زَحْزَحَهُ اللَّهُ عَنِ النَّارِ سَبْعِينَ خَرِيفًا Anyone who fasts one day فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ has two meanings. 
One opinion would suggest that it is the mujahid fi sabilillah that fasts, but it's not limited to that. The next meaning is the one who fasts it for the sake of Allah, sincerely for Allah's sake. Then Allah would move his face from the fire 70 years. And wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, now we're living days of winter in Australia. Very simple, very easy. It's cold, it's windy, you're not as thirsty, you're not as hungry during the day. The hours are very short, very simple. Take advantage of them. Make the most of them. As many as you can fast of the days fast. And the best is Monday and Thursday or three days of every month. Each and every single fast is removing the person from the path of the hellfire, admitting him onto the path to the paradise. This is the attitude of a believer. Every single day is an opportunity to gain closeness to Allah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we are in need of righteous good deeds. We are in need every single day. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Inna al-insana la fi khusr illa al-ladina amanu wa amilu salihat." All of mankind is in loss. All of us, except the one who believes and engages in righteous deeds. If you don't engage in righteous deeds, then the default position you're in loss. The person is in loss. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to save us. We are in need. Allah Azza wa Jalla says. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds for them is a complete forgiveness of sins and a huge reward. A huge reward means the paradise. Only for those who do righteous deeds. That's why we indeed, you cannot afford to look yesterday at yesterday. Subhanallah, I've done the enough. Well, last Ramadan, alhamdulillah, we picked up the pace. Every day is a new opportunity. For trying to engage in me with these ahadith and implementing them. Finally, we're coming to the end of the ayah. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, In this last part of the ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the absolute core reason for why people are distracted from righteous deeds and preparation for death. The ayah began with death and the ayah ended with the reason for why people are distracted from preparing for death. And that is, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ And this worldly life is nothing but a deception, an enjoyment that is a deception. إِلَّا مَتَاعُ مَتَاعُ is an enjoyment. غُرُور deception. يعني it's a fake enjoyment. It's a fake enjoyment. This is what mata'al ghurur means. You know, let's say you made a business deal with someone and he gave you a suitcase of wealth and you're excited, Allahu Akbar, I cracked the deal of the century. And you went home and you opened it and they're all fake 100 bills. How shattered and distraught is a person. That's the one who ran after this world in life, did not prepare for the afterlife, ends up on the day of judging, ends up on the day of death. Realizes that it was all fake. It is. Look how fake it is. You drink water, or you drink a nice, cool, cold beverage, whatever it is that you enjoy and you love, and a few hours later, it goes. It goes. You eat something, the most delicious meal you look forward to. Give it a few hours, it's come out gone. It didn't. It did not retain. It, your whole body didn't hold it. You have friends today. You sit back with, you enjoy time with, you like it, you love it, you find peace in it. All of a sudden, Wallah brother, our mate passed away. Allahu Akbar, how fake was that? I spent years sitting, laughing, joking, enjoying our time. Now he's gone. All of a sudden he's gone. You work, you work, you work to save for a $300 shirt. Alhamdulillah. I've got a $300 shirt. Six months later, it wears and tears away, throw it in the bin. Fake! How fake was that? Woman hayatu dunya illa mata'u al ghurur. Anything you buy and you look forward to and you desire it and you saved, you saved for it. They call it the dream. Hack, work, 
Go get a loan from the bank. Go do al haram. Doesn't matter because there's a dream waiting for you. Own a house. And then, whatever you own, you die, you depart from it, you leave it. How fake was that? Wallahi, nothing is more fake than the pleasures of this worldly life. Nothing is more fake. The day you die, everything is gone. Everything is finished. What is real is righteous deeds. They remain with you. You see, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, two rak'at sunnah, you pray before salat al-fajr, is better than this worldly life and everything in it. You know what that means? How can it be? Two rak'at, I spend three, four minutes in them, is better for me than all this world and its gold and its silver and its jewelry and its luxuries, its cars, its wealth, its homes, its castles. How? How do we understand this? You know how? Very simple. Because if you had all of this, it's only going to be for a short while, then it disappears. But these two rak'at, the reward of theirs is permanent. It comes with you as you die in your grave. And then it follows you on the day of judgment and it's put it until it's put on your scale and it admits you into the paradise by Allah's permission. Therefore, how can the worldly life be better than that? When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لو كانت الدنيا تزن عند الله جناح بعوضة ما سقى منها الكافر شربة ماء If this worldly life was to have the value in the sight of Allah the wing of a mosquito not two wings, the wing of a mosquito so this is like a dead mosquito and you've pulled the wing off if the worldly life was to have some value with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if it had the value as this wing if it had the same value he wouldn't have given a sip of water for a disbeliever. What the hadith means is the fact that they are drinking water, it is not even to the value of a wing of a mosquito. And so when people fight over this world, they life and kill each other, you know what the idea is? It's one pulling on one end of a wing of a mosquito and the other pulling the other end. Give me the wing and I take, I don't want the wing from you. That's essentially what's happening. Have you seen two people fight over a wing of a mosquito? That's two people fighting over the luxuries and enjoyments of this worldly life. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that a sign of the end of time, you know what happens? Listen to this. He said, The earth would spew out its organs. What does that mean? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Amthal al min al wal fidda. It would spew out, it rejects it, it brings it out. Pillars of gold and silver. That's at the end of time, before the last day. Gold and silver, the size of pillars, would pop out from the earth. Hadith Sahih. And people would walk and see it. فَيَجِيءُ الْقَاتِلِ فَيَقُولُ فِي هَذَا قَتَلْتِ And a murderer would go past and he would say, it was for this I killed such and such person. Look at it, it's for free, take it. But there's no more time because the, uh, the, the, the events of the, uh, the hour are going to strike very soon. He says, it's because of this I killed such and such person. And the thief whose hand was chopped would say, my hand was chopped because of this. Look at it, it's for free, take what you like. وَيَجِيءُ الْقَاطِعُ فَيَقُولُ لِهَذَا قَطَعْتُ رَحِمِي And the one who severed ties with his blood relations, the one who cut ties with his brother, his blood brother, or his sister, or his mother, father, or his son or daughter, he would say, look, I cut ties that Allah commanded me to maintain and connect because of this. But it's too late. The people, Allah Azza wa Jal would bring the reality to people of what this world their life was. You want to take it? Take it, it's coming out like pillars. But there's the class, the people would realize at that moment, subhanAllah, for my brothers and sisters in Islam, a dunya that you have, the wealth that you collect, use it to seek Allah's pleasure and don't use it to continuously seek your own pleasure. Use the wealth primarily to seek Allah's pleasure. Do good with it. 
the biggest reason for why this worldly life has become a distraction and a fitna for many is one thing. The biggest reason, and that is greed. That's it. The only reason for why this worldly life has become a fitna to the point where people have forgotten death and the preparation for death is because of the greed. And greed is something Allah put in us, but we need to control it. Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Anyone who takes control over the greed in himself is indeed successful. This is the problem. How do you get rid of greed? How do you solve greed in the heart? By remembering death, and that is the beginning of the ayah, and by continuously giving, seeking Allah's pleasure. And that way, your greed is controlled, you've taken control of it, you're seeking Allah's pleasure with it, you do not desire, keep losing the love of it, keep giving and give from that which you love. As Allah Azza wa said, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not attain the paradise until you give from that which you love. This is our deen, this is our religion, this is how Allah Azza wa keeps us away from the distractions of this worldly life in preparation for death. This is what I wanted to share with you in this moment, in this beautiful blessed gathering that we had at the end, my brothers and sisters in Islam, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us all, to save us from fitnatul mahya wal mamat, wa min fitnatul masih al dajjal. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bestow His mercy and His forgiveness upon us all. We ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to admit us in the paradise ma'an nabiyyina wa siddiqina wa shuhadai wa salihin wa hasuna ulaika rafiqa. Jazakum Allahu khayran for your attendance. Wa baraka Allahu fikum. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. If anyone has any question, I'll give you a few minutes to ask. Otherwise, if Abu Hamza has something prepared for us, then يعني, we'll give him. Barakallahu feek. Any question, brothers and sisters? No. I was hoping you. Uh, <laughs> Habib. The best advice I've ever been given to seek knowledge. Tabar. If a family member has left Islam, is it allowed to cut ties with him? If a family member has left Islam, then he's still a family member. Nuh alayhi salam's son was not a believer, but yet Nuh alayhi salam would continue his relation with his son, advising him and calling him to Allah Azza wa Jal. So you follow in the example of Nuh alayhi salam, and you continue to maintain ties with the family that are non-Muslims, and your objective with them and your purpose with maintaining ties primarily is to call them to Islam, to invite them to Islam, to bring them back to the straight path and the path of guidance. And Allah Azza wa Jal يعني, does what He wills. Now, anyone? Tawbah. Now, uh, يولون وجوههم وأدبارهم يضربون وجوههم ولو ترى إذ يتوفى الذين كفروا الملائكة يضربون وجوههم وأدبارهم وذوقوا عذاب الحريق. It is mentioned that the angels, as they approach the disbeliever and remove his soul from his body, they do strike the back of his head and they strike his body as the soul is being ripped out from his body. Now, for this is something that is mentioned by المفسرون.